Good evening and, and welcome to this evening's Lundy webinar, the third in our new series of talks. I'm Michael Williams and I'm Secretary of the Lundy Field Society. I'm coming to you live from a, a virtual Morisco Tavern as usual this evening, uh, but in reality I'm at home in Cambridge. Tonight I will be joined by Josh Harris, who is going to showcase some of his fantastic wildlife photos and tell us the stories about how he was able to take them. Many of you will have seen Josh's photos on social media, and I think we're in for a real visual treat this evening. On to the usual housekeeping arrangements. Um, if you're a regular viewer, uh, then please do make yourself comfortable while I go through the usual announcement. We won't be able to see or hear any of you at home as only the microphones and video cameras on Josh's computer and my computer are enabled. As ever, Dave Richards is behind the scenes hosting the Zoom session and will make a recording available afterwards on YouTube. If you're watching on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A function. Just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then type your question into the box that, box that pops up. If you're on a mobile or tablet, then you can find it on the menu bar. There's also a chat feature for comments and feedback, which Dave and I will be monitoring during the talk. Welcome also to our viewers on YouTube. Uh, I'm afraid there's no facility for you to ask questions though. Okay, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker. Okay. Hello, Josh. Hello. Great to have you here. Uh, so just a few words of introduction before I hand over to Josh. Uh, Josh Harris is a recent zoology graduate from the university here in Cambridge uh, and a keen wildlife photographer. He presents and films his own short wildlife films and is particularly fascinated by beavers and nature restoration in the UK. Josh has his own website, uh, joshuaharriswildlife.co.uk. I'm sure Josh will plug that later on, uh, where you can see further examples of his photography and films. Uh, and you can also follow him on Instagram at joshharriswild. OK, Josh. As I say, it's great to have you here. I'm going to hand over to you now. So the floor's yours. Okay, thank you. I'll just share the screen and here we go. Okay, so yeah, as Michael has said, uh, my name's Josh and I recently graduated from Cambridge, but I've been visiting uh, Lundy a lot um, for probably like 15 years now with my family. And then yeah, a couple of years ago, I was a volunteer for the whole summer. So most of the pictures were taken in that time when I was a volunteer. And I think, you know, by kind of visiting it a lot and spending a really solid like three months there, I've really got to like know the island. And then I think that's enabled me to take a lot of unique photos. So that's kind of how I'm going to be talking about uh, in the talk. So originally I was like really obsessed with goats, uh, as you can see from this photo. And I think the goats are really charismatic. Uh, they're very hairy. Um, they're very photogenic. So I was like completely obsessed with these for probably like 10 years. And I just spent all the time following them around. Um, and then there's also deer, obviously. They're a bit, you know, a bit more kind of typically charismatic. Most people aren't really that interested in goats, whereas I was just totally obsessed with goats. Um, so, but, you know, because deer have been photographed a lot, it's kind of good to try and photograph them in, in more interesting ways that other people haven't really done so much. So here where they're running, you can use like a slow shutter speed. Um, or this is one really cool thing I did uh, to show them in this amazing environment. So for those of you that have visited Lundy, you'll know there's this small wood called Quarterwall Copse, where the trees are really picturesque. Um, they look like something out of a fairy tale. They're covered in moss and lichen and everything. So I thought it'd be really cool to show the deer, and particularly because the deer in the summer are super picturesque with their spotty coats, uh, to, to show them in this environment. So here I actually had a little motion sensor attached to the camera and then the camera was like left there for about a week and then as the deer walk past they trigger the motion sensor um but this is all i'm really going to say about the terrestrial animals actually because what i really want to talk about is the seabirds and that's what i really focused on when i was a volunteer on lundy spending a lot of time watching the seabirds and photographing and filming them and what i really wanted to do is show them in their marine environment 
because this is a picture taken in Shetland, actually. It's one of the only two pictures that's not on Lundy. But this just kind of illustrates like the classic sort of puffin photo. It's just a nice portrait of a puffin standing on the clifftop, and it's really nice. Uh, well, similarly, here on Skoma, it's a puffin flying in with the fish, and it's the classic thing that everyone goes and photographs. Um, but puffins are really not very well adapted to actually walking around on land or flying. So they're quite clumsy on land, and then they're quite inefficient at flying because they've got quite short wings and they have to flap very fast and use a lot of energy. Uh, whereas they are well adapted to swimming under the water where these short wings are ideal, uh, almost like penguins using their flippers in order to almost kind of fly through the water. So what I really wanted to do when I had this three month period on Lundy as a volunteer um, was I thought it would be a really good opportunity to try and photograph and film puffins underwater. Uh, and this was absolutely amazing because I was just snorkeling around every evening and every morning and then the puffins were diving down and I was just watching them you know, sort of flying through this like transparent water. The water quality was amazing. And then all the bubbles are lighting up in the sunlight. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and I said, I was sort of up in puffins. In fact, a lot of the pictures were of guillemots because there are a lot more guillemots on Lundy. Um, but yeah, I became really obsessed with, with photographing them and particularly photographing them in the, in the amazing light that you get late in the evening and early in the morning. Uh, and this was partly just because I was actually like surveying the puffins and seals and uh, sorting out the recycling and stuff during the middle of the day. So the only option really was to photograph and film stuff at sunrise and sunset. And that's really the best times. So I think that was the main reason why this three months was when, when I took like the best photos of my whole life, I think, because I was literally only going out at sunrise and sunset and I never actually photographed anything in the middle of the day. So in order to get out there at sunrise, uh, I was sleeping out um, at Gannett's Coombe, which is like the north, near the north end of the island, uh, quite a lot. So uh, having, having gone snorkeling on the west side of the island at sunset, I would then sort of go back, eat something, and then walk up to Gannett's Coombe, uh, sleep there, get up at like 4.30 in the morning. And then as you get out of your sleeping bag at 4.30 in the morning, you can then get in the wetsuit and then get in the water at around five o'clock as the sun is just coming up. And this was absolutely incredible. Uh, I really felt really immersed in nature because uh, you can hear the Manx Shearwaters calling in the night and then you hear the seals kind of wailing as it's just getting light. And then you get in the water, uh, you feel like the cold water going around you and you watch the sunrise. And then you're just swimming uh, just offshore and seeing the amazing light hitting the island. Um, and then I would swim out to the end of Gannett's Rock, which, if, if you don't know, is this kind of rock that uh, uh, sticks out into the sea. Uh, it's just separate from Lundy, like a little separate island. And there are quite a lot of seabirds nesting on that. And I would kind of float around in the water uh, on the eastern side of it, watching the sunrise. And then some of the waves would sort of splash over me like that. And then the, the guillemots and a few puffins would fly over my head in front of the sunrise. Uh, and, and then they'd also be down on the water. Uh, and then at sunset, I would do the same thing on the west side of the island. So some days I estimated that I spent around seven hours in the water. Um, so from around five until eight in the morning and then like seven until half past ten at night. Uh, and on the west side of the island, it was really incredible to, to be kind of floating, you know, 100 or 150 metres out from the shore. Because then you really feel that you're actually kind of immersed in their marine environment. You're not just kind of watching them from the coast you're actually like properly in the sea and you're sort of looking back at the coastline. Uh, so yeah, like I said, I was obsessed with this amazing light that you get shining on their wings through the water uh, as you see them diving down. And then the bubble trails are lit up. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, and here I've tried to do a, a kind of slow shutter speed effect of the bubble trails. And I, I tried doing this so many times and I, almost all the images were rubbish. But then this one, I think is actually quite good. You can just see the bubbles there kind of blurred as it's zooming down. Um, and then what's also really amazing that you can see in this image and also in the next image is that you, you can see the trail like of each wing beat. So here you can see it's just beating its wings and you can see there are bubbles just coming off the end of the wing. And in here, you can see there's almost 
uh, a line going down and then there's a kind of uh, line of bubbles going vertically and that's the sort of imprint of one wing beat. And when there, are about, when there were about sort of 20 guillemots all flying around under the water, then the whole water was just full of all these bubble trails and it was all lit up in the sunlight. And it was just absolutely insane. Um, I was really immersed in their underwater world, I think. And it was incredible to see like how agile they are under the water uh, compared to how clumsy they are, they are on land, especially the guillemots, because they, they really can't walk around on land at all very well. They just sort of wobb uh, waddle around on the ledges. Um, and then, yeah, one thing that I was really, really keen to do, and this took probably about six weeks of attempts when I was going out almost every evening and every morning, was to photograph a guillemot or a puffin uh, silhouetted against these kind of golden rays of light. So I'd seen a, a picture by a guy called Alden Ricardson, who's this Norwegian photographer who does these absolutely incredible photos of, of killer whales and humpback whales and white-tailed eagles. And, and because he has the midnight sun in northern Norway in the summer, he can, it's almost like a really prolonged sunset. So you can get this underwater effect of this golden light for hours on end. And he had this amazing picture of a, a killer whale diving with this amazing golden light. So I wanted to mimic that with a guillemot. And like I've, I've showed you with this picture of a jellyfish, there were plenty of opportunities to do, a, do this with jellyfish because there were loads of jellyfish. So I could sort of practice it on jellyfish and then after six weeks of trying, I did eventually get this one picture of a guillemot. Um, and I think this is not perfect. It, the guillemot is a bit small in the frame and you can't, maybe you can't quite tell it's a guillemot if you don't know. Um, but I think this is quite unique. I nev I've never seen anyone else take a picture like this where they've got this amazing golden light effect uh, with a seabird diving. Uh, so I thought that was really incredible. And then as I was snorkeling around every evening, uh, watching all these seabirds swimming around under the water, I was also seeing them on the surface floating around in these big rafts. So they were kind of floating around in these rafts and I'd sort of gradually swim up to them. And then they'd sort of dive down and investigate me underneath the water. Um, but as I was floating around with these rafts, I also sort of noticed them silhouetted against the sunset. So as I was uh, snorkeling and as the sun was going down, as the waves were rolling in, the puffins were just silhouetted against the sunset as, as they were on top of the waves. So in order to photograph this, I made this little raft. So one of my duties as a volunteer was to sort through all the recycling. Uh, and as you may know, if you visited Lundy, there's, there's always a problem with the water supply. So there's always bottles. So with this supply of bottles, I made this little raft and then I could put the camera on that. And then that could get the camera at a really low level because in order to get a puffin silhouetted against the sunset when it's on the water surface, you need the camera to be as close to the water as possible. Uh, so even if you're in a kayak, I think you'd be you'd still be too high up in a kayak. And then I also had this um, cuddly puffin that I bought in the shop um, and I tied that on my head and I, so that the puffins would kind of sort of come and investigate me. But I don't think that actually made much difference because they're very curious anyway. So even without the cuddly puffin, they would still just come up to me. So this is the, the kind of image that, that um, was the result of making this raft. So I would sort of go in every evening at, at uh, seven o'clock and then quite a lot of the time I'd go in trying to photograph them underwater first and then as it was getting later I'd suddenly rush out again like change all the camera stuff over to a different lens like get the raft and then go back in again to get the final moments of the sun the sun going down with these silhouettes and there were a lot of different conditions so uh, some days it was it was like a really bright sun whereas here this time it, there was a bit of a sort of haze and and then you get the sun sort of shining through in that uh, kind of hexagon shape, which is just because of the, the metal bit in the lens. It's not very exciting, but um, yeah, there were loads of amazing different conditions. And on this day, it was really calm, but some days it was really rough and it was a bit, bit scary, like uh, getting in and out through the waves uh, with this expensive camera and holding this raft and wearing flippers and then having to climb up over the rocks. Um, yeah, but... Yeah, like I said, there were loads of different conditions. And what's really amazing is when the waves were kind of rolling in and then the puffins were silhouetted on top of the wave and then I was floating down in the trough between the waves. Uh, and that was really challenging to get them in focus because 
everything is kind of moving like that the waves are going up and down and then the puffins are moving around um and then the raft it, it wasn't particularly stable i mean it because it was so close to the water level even slight ripples meant that it was it was wobbling a lot so it was very tricky to get these these images that were slightly in focus um and this was the image that i was i was really pleased with after this time and i sort of put this on my social media a lot and new stuff on my website and entertaining competitions and stuff um and i thought this was really unique and this was my best image ever but then actually in preparing a talk a few a few weeks ago uh, i came across this one which had been lost in the hard drive just because i've taken so many photos from this this three month period that i still sometimes just go back into the folder on the computer at the weekend to just find new things and yeah this image i think is the most insane image i've ever taken it was the most mind-boggling experience uh, to just be snorkeling at sunset every day and watching these puffins floating around silhouetted in front of the sunset um, and i was really like immersed in in their world i think because often when you're watching wildlife at a nature reserve from a hide or something you're just kind of observing them from a long distance whereas here i felt i was really immersed in the seabirds world actually kind of floating around you know one or 200 meters offshore and looking back at the cliffs with the seabirds flying over my head and diving under the water um and it also made me think that these sort of moments must happen all the time and you know the puffins will experience things like this low uh, you know uncountless times during their lives so you really just got to be there in order to photograph it i think and the reason why you know people haven't photographed these things uh yeah you know, or the reason why it's so rare to get a, a really amazing photo of a wildlife encounter is not because those things are rare it's just because people aren't actually out there doing it nearly as much as it actually happens right so i, I guess what i'm trying to say is that like my advice is that you've really got to, got to spend as much time out in the field photographing stuff as possible. Okay, and this was just one image that I really wanted to get, but then I never really managed this. So I wanted to get a puffin flapping its wings with the sun set in the background. And this one is all right, but the wing on is on the right hand side is a bit blurred and you can't see its beak. So if its beak was just sort of facing the other way, then that would be the best image. But as, uh, as far as it goes, the first one is better. And yeah, even, even without uh, counting in the fact that I was snorkeling with these puffins, I had amazing, amazing experiences just through spending so much time outside exploring the island. So when I would wake up each morning, there was an amazing sunrise. Uh, and I had, you know, the three months that I was there, the visibility was incredible, the weather was incredible. Uh, and then every evening I'd just go and see the sun go down over the horizon. Uh, and then just after the sun had gone down, then I'd just be getting out and clam clambering up the rocks as it was getting dark. So it was really absolutely amazing. I felt really alive and I was really uh, loving life, I think. Um, but yeah, some days when it's actually really cloudy, you can also get a really amazing sunset because then as the sun comes between this really narrow gap in the clouds, then the light can be really amazing. And I'm not sure why that is, but I would say that it's potentially because then the sun is sort of reflecting off the clouds above. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of being bounced back off of the layer of cloud and then it's more intense, like uh, the light is more intense. OK, and then after the seabirds, after the orcs, like the puffins, guillemots and razorbills had gone, uh, which was in about kind of mid-August, then after that, I still had one and a half more months. And so after that, I sort of switched on to photographing seals. Uh, so seals were a lot easier to photograph than the puffins because they're quite inquisitive. Uh, and they also live on the east side of the island where the water is normally quite calm. Whereas on the west side with the puffins, it did get quite rough sometimes. And then it was a bit hairy, like getting in and out. Um, and what I really wanted to do with seals is to photograph them half in, half out like this, because I did originally think of doing that with the puffin and then having the spectacular cliffs in the background. Uh, but then I was never successful in doing that because although the puffins were quite inquisitive, they didn't they didn't come nearly close enough in order to get them quite large in the frame and getting this half in, half out perspective. Whereas with a the seal, they are really inquisitive. They actually come up and investigate. 
So you can quite easily get this half in, half out. And here again, I use some plastic bottles. Um, I sort of attach them to the camera just to increase the buoyancy very slightly so that you could get it a perfectly, uh, perfectly half in and half out. Uh, so the reason I did that is because I remember on Blue Planet 2, they, they, they built this thing they called the Mega Dome uh, to get like a half in and half out shot of a walrus. Um, and they had a load of floats attached to it so that it was constantly floating at just the right level. So I had my camera in underwater housing, but then I, I also put on these uh, plastic bottles that were just full of air, but then you could adjust the amount of air in them in order to get it just right. And the seals are super inquisitive. So yeah, it, it, the snorkeling with the seals is amazing because they just come up and investigate you. They like to investigate your flippers. And I think that's because the flippers are something that they can kind of relate to. It sort of looks a bit familiar to them. Um, and then, yeah, often what I would do is sort of float around and then they'd come and investigate the flippers. And then I would sort of awkwardly turn around and be like uh, kind of falling down into the water with the snorkel filling up the water. And then I, I would take these pictures like that. Um, and as well as being really inquisitive, coming to investigate humans, they're also quite playful uh, with each other. So when I was spending around three hours each morning at sunrise snorkeling with the seals, and then I would see these amazing behaviours uh, when they were they were sort of getting used to my presence a little bit after the three hours. Um, they were behaving more naturally, having spent the three hours in there with them, I think. Um, and yeah, one of the things I kind of envisaged was that I wanted to get a picture of a seal blowing bubbles where you would sort of look through the bubbles at the seal. So here I was floating on the surface and then the seal was down below and it blew some bubbles up and then you're sort of looking through the bubbles out of the seal, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and again, as I was doing with the guillemots, I became really obsessed with this golden light uh, sort of backlighting thing uh, where you're sort of looking at the sunset and then the sunset is filtering through the water. Um, and I think that's what I probably spent too long trying to do this. Uh, and then I sort of wasted time that I could have spent taking, uh, you know, more normal pictures where, where it wasn't backlit like this. But um, I think this is a really cool effect. Um, but then, yeah, having been obsessed with photographing stuff in this amazing light, then I did also kind of realize that actually when the light is sort of bad, and that can also be quite good um, when it's more overcast and cloudy, then it's more sort of blue and, and that's also quite cool. Or here, for example, it's quite overcast and cloudy and then you can see the colours and details of the rocks. Uh, and I said that it's quite good to do these sort of half in half outs, but then also people get a bit bored of them. They've been done a lot. So I think this one is also quite cool where it's sort of a half in half out, but then you're actually kind of looking down. Um, and then this is with a fisheye lens to get this kind of curved effect. Yeah, and then this is one, this is a kind of standalone image. It's the only image I have of this, but this was this amazing spider crab gathering, which I saw just a few months ago, actually, when I went there on holiday with my family. And then, uh, yeah, it was, it was insane. It was just off the jetty where you get on the boat and there was these thousands and thousands of crabs just covering the sea floor and they were all crawling all over each other. It was like something out of a David Attenborough documentary. Um, and there's a really good book uh, by George Monbiot called Feral, which is all about uh, this idea of rewilding. Uh, but there's this one really cool passage where he talks about a spider crab gathering that he was watching in Wales. And he kind of says that, you know, all e potentially almost all ecosystems in the past once resembled the Serengeti. Well, that's what he says as a kind of metaphor, um, in the sense that there were once these vast herds of creatures in everywhere on the planet. Uh, and it's just that in many places we've diminished these vast herds of creatures. So I think this was really amazing to see these kind of vast herds of spider crabs and then imagine that, you know, this is, is what it might have been like in a, in a pristine ecosystem. And with the Lundy no take zone, obviously, I mean, that's a really exciting conservation project, I think. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really amazing uh, kind of spectacle of a huge abundance of nature that you just often don't see. Um, you might see a few species or a few individuals of one species, but to then see these thousands and thousands of crabs congregating. I think that was really incredible. Okay, and then 
the next thing is full Mars. So I was it, after the most of the seabirds, the orcs, the puffins, guillemots, razor bells, after they had gone, the full Mars are still there. So they pretty much stay there for most of the year, I think. And they're always just flying around the cliff tops. And they're quite fun to photograph because they spend a lot of time just gliding around the cliffs. And they're extremely acrobatic and they zoom around and do these hairpin bends and they sort of hover on the updrafts and then dive and soar. Um, and they're very fun to photograph because you can spend a lot of time watching them. And I think the real key to getting good photos is to watch them and predict predict how they're flying around. So if you find uh, you know, a small group of them, then if you watch one individual, they're often actually following a circuit, which they repeat. They might do like a figure of eight around, around a bay or something. And then if you find a position which is on that figure of eight, then you can get them repeatedly flying past. So most of the time that I would go out to photograph for Mars, I hardly really took any photos. Uh, I was really just watching them and only taking a few photos. Um, but mainly just watching their behavior and then uh, predicting where they were flying so that I could get in the right position. And I think that's the real key is that you've got to spend a lot of time watching the species and understanding the location uh, and also the lighting conditions and where you want it to be positioned and what the background wants to look like. Um, yeah, so I think that is that is the key to photographing full moss. Um, so yeah, here, this is an amazing photo, I think, of one that's kind of hovering in the updrafts. So that's another good tip for photographing them, is that if you find where there's the updrafts are coming up, then they'll often slow down as they sort of turn around and hover there a little bit. And then it's much easier to focus on them uh, when they're slower than if they're just rocketing past. And then as with the puffins, it was amazing to photograph them at sunset because uh, you get the amazing light. Um, so it was an absolute dream, really. Um, I would just go there every evening as like when I was a volunteer uh, and spend a few hours watching the full moths flying around and photographing them zooming past. And yeah, as, as the, the months went on, everything, the pictures got a lot better because I was learning their behavior and finding the best places for the amazing light. Uh, so for example, here you can get the sort of dark background of the cliffs and then you get sort of waves and droplets of water that are, the, are sort of splashing up and, and then lighting up. Uh, and then what I really tried to do for when I was a volunteer and a few other times I've been there is I really wanted to get a picture of a full mile that's just, you know, his head is pretty much, oh, his whole body is just filling the frame and it's just rocketing towards the camera at top speed. And I want to have his eyes in focus, but it to be so close that its feet are like out of focus. And this is extremely hard because they are super fast when or when when they're sort of turning around, then they're quite slow. But as they're rocketing towards you, they go super fast. And then it's extremely hard to focus on them uh, with the camera because they're coming so fast towards you. And there's the cliffs in the background, which is a distraction. Uh, but this is the best one I've got so far, I think. So this Walmart was kind of zooming down the slope. It was pretty low to the ground. And I was just crouched down there with my camouflage nesting over the top of me. And then it just, this was, this, it was about a couple of meters away when I took this photo and then it just rocketed over my head. Um, so yeah, they're absolutely incredible birds. And then another thing I wanted to do was photograph them against the sunset. Uh, so this photo was one that I thought was really good when I sort of first did it. Um, and what's particularly cool here is I think you can, you can just see its tube nose and the kind of hook's beak. Uh, in the silhouette there. And tube noses are like quite a distinctive feature of fulmars and albatrosses and petrels and shearwaters and this family of birds. Uh, and I think they use that to excrete the salt and it also gives them a, really, it gives them a really good sense of smell. Uh, but then this one, this silhouette is a lot nicer, but then you don't actually have the sun in this picture. Uh, this is a guillemot obviously, but it's just got quite a nicer background. Um, and then this is a shag and the background is quite nice, but I haven't really got the perfect full mile sunset image yet, is what I'm saying. So all these images are showing sort of different elements. This one has got the nice clouds and stuff. The other one has got the nice uh, silhouette of the full mile. The other one has got the sun in it, but I haven't got one image that actually combines all these things. Um, yeah, and then 
the another thing that is really amazing about seabirds and uh, full miles and seabirds in general is the amazing environment they live in with the crashing waves and the cliffs and the amazing lights and the ocean so I kind of really want to photograph four miles with crashing waves in the background. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of attempts at this, but it was never that successful because, mainly because what you really need is you need it to be really windy in order to get the crashing waves and the swell coming in. But then it also needs to be really sunny because you want to get the golden light at the end of the day at sunset. Um, and it's quite rare that you get that combination because often when it's sunny, then it's quite calm. And then when it's uh, really crashing waves and it's raining or something. Um, but there was one evening when I was there that, that did have this amazing blend of conditions. Um, I never managed to get a full mile, but there was this amazing place where you could uh, lie down on the edge of the cliff. And there was this really solid granite outcrop in Jenny's Cove, which is like on the west side of the island, uh, sort of halfway up, if you don't know. Um, there's this really solid granite outcrop and it's a complete vertical edge um so you can just lie on it with your head over the edge and then holding the camera like that and then you look straight down and there's this colony of guillemots down there and then you see the waves smashing in below them uh and then i did manage to get this picture of a kitty wake um i think you know kitty wakes are very nice but i think full bars are more picturesque and they're they're my favorite uh, seabird species I think because of the way they glide uh, so effortlessly uh, but this is pretty cool and I recommend checking out this guy called Kevin Morgans who's this amazing photographer who's done lots of stuff with seabirds in Shetland uh, and he and he kind of inspired me to do this this kind of image uh, after he had done these amazing images of gannets in Shetland where he did have these incredible smashing waves, like smashing into 100 meter high cliffs and gannets riding over the, the updrafts and stuff. Uh, but so far, this is my, my best image of that kind. Uh, yeah, and then this was one sort of work in progress, which I just tried the last time I went to Lundy, is to show a sort of wide angle perspective, showing them with the whole coastline in the background. So to do this, the camera is set up on a tripod and then it's got a wide angle lens and then you have a remote control uh, where the receiver is attached to the camera and then you've got the other end of the remote and then you can sit up on right at the top of, at the path about 200 meters away and you can watch with your binoculars and then as, a, as you see a, a full bar fly past the camera then you can trigger it uh, and this is a work in progress like I said because the full bar is quite small in the frame here what I'd really like is for it to be you know, right up uh, in front of the camera uh, so that its wings are spanning across the whole image. And then you can just see the coastline going away into the background. And this is the final image in the talk. Um, and this is just my only image that I've ever taken of a peregrine on Lundy, or the only one that was any good. Uh, because when I was younger, there were a few times when I went to Lundy with my family where I pretty much spent the whole holiday just sitting uh, under a camo net in some bracken or behind a rock trying to photograph a peregrine um, and I didn't really do anything else with the family or anything I just did that for the whole holiday pretty much um, uh, because I had a few encounters close encounters with peregrines uh, just by chance and it was it's absolutely incredible to see them close up so I just sort of identified various different rocks um, and then staked out each one for about a week each year uh, but then it was completely unsuccessful. Um, I didn't get any images at all. But then actually the last time I visited Lundy, I'd sort of given up on this. But then as I was photographing full Mars, I just turned around and there was a peregrine just sat uh, just a few metres away. And it was extremely lucky because it was actually looking the other way. So I just sort of looked at it and thought, oh my God, there's a peregrine right there. And then because it was looking the other way, I just had time to get my camera uh, turned around to get the right settings. And then it turned around and looked at me and then I took one picture and I just flew off. Uh, but if you'd like to see more pictures of peregrines, I, I've got a lot of pictures of peregrines. I took in Cambridge because uh, there was an amazing colony outside my bedroom window and that, that's a whole other story. Um, OK, so that is the end of the talk. Um, so we now have time for questions and I believe you've got to put your questions in the chat and then Michael will read them out. Uh, but I would also like to plug my calendars, which I've made. So. 
uh, every year I make these calendars uh, in order to uh, fund uh, buying more equipment and going to cool places like in Shetland. Um, so these feature some images from Lundy, like you've seen in the talk, uh, and then also images from other places, uh, from in Shetland, for example. And I sell these for £10 each. And if you'd like to buy one, then please uh, send me an email. My email is josh at Joshua Harris Wildlife. So There's the website of josh at the website. Um, and then you can also follow me on, on social media if you'd like to. Um, and I guess I should just explain that picture was also taken on Lundy. That's at the north end of the island, uh, just with a long exposure to get the Milky Way. Uh, and because there's, it's quite you know, far out at sea, the, the light pollution is very low. So I definitely recommend going out um, in the night to look at stars if you're on Lundy. OK, so that is the end of the talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, I think I said we'd be in for a visual treat and uh, and you've certainly delivered on that. It's been really, really incredible just to sit here uh, and enjoy um, looking at all these fantastic pictures of Lundy uh, and hearing you talk about uh, the uh, escapades you got up to in, uh, in, in getting, getting those photos. So really fantastic. Um, we've got a few questions coming in, but yeah, for people watching at home, don't forget to put your, your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, Josh, then we okay. can uh, both appear next to each other on the screen. That'd be great. Thank you. So uh, let me just pull up um, the questions. So um, the first question is from Keith Minton. So Keith is asking, uh, what equipment are you using camera-wise? Yeah, so I have a Canon 7D Mark II, and then I have a 100 to 400 lens uh, for many of the close-up things. And I also have a 10 to 20 millimeter lens for wide angle stuff, and an eight millimeter lens, which is a fisheye lens for some of the underwater stuff. Um, and then I also have a tripod and an underwater housing for the camera uh and a few other little plastic bits that you add on to the videos and stuff yeah so how do you keep your uh, cameras waterproof when you're uh when you're oh, i've taking... got an underwater housing for that i said yeah i, I think we've got a number of photographers yeah, i so... funded that with the calendars that's why you've got to buy the calendars so yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we've got a few few bits of feedback as well grant cousin says what brilliant pictures uh, John Tyra, so those of you who've uh, been joining us regularly for these webinars remember that John Tyra and Philip Limbury did a, a photography workshop back uh, in the spring when we were in the depths of lockdown. Uh, John says uh, those sea surface images are truly unique and really great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and he, John also enjoyed the, the head on fulmar pictures as well. I, I certainly, uh, when they were up on the screen, the, the, the plumage, the, the quality of the photography where you can really see the detail in the plumage on the full yeah. is really great. Uh, a question from our very own Dave Richards. Uh, what would you say the balance of time was between shooting stroke learning animal behavior stroke working out compositions and did that vary very much between taking photos on the land and taking photos on the sea? Um, I don't know I mean to be honest I don't I guess I don't really think that much about like the compositions like, from a photographic perspective, because I'm not really that interested in like photography. I mean, I, I, I would never photograph stuff that wasn't wildlife. So I'm really fo thinking about the animals. Um, you know, when I'm out photographing stuff, I'm really thinking about the wildlife. Um, but I guess, I mean, the two things are kind of connected, right? Because in order to think about the composition, You've got to think, well, you know, where do I want that full mar to be? What do I want the background to look like? How do I want the lighting to be? And then in order to think about that, you've got to think, well, where is this full mar flying? And then you've got to like, you know, understand its behavior, like what sort of route it's taking around the cliff tops and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I would say that the two things are kind of inextricably linked, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm mainly thinking about the behaviour of the animals, really. I don't particularly think that much about um, the composition of the image, like as a form of art or anything. It's more like about behaviour and the animals. So, yeah. Would you say that a lot of the, the images are sometimes you just 
just luck you were in the right place at the right time with your camera set up. Yeah, yeah. But then I guess it's lucky, but you're spending like a lot of time there. So, I mean, like with these ones of the puffins on the water surface with the sunset in the background, I guess, I mean, that does, yeah, require some thinking about the composition. But also, it was just incredibly lucky to get these few, these handful of images of, you know, out of all the evenings I was there for about six weeks. Um, because the camera is sort of moving up and down uh, as the waves come in and then the puffins are moving around and then it's hard to focus because the sunset is distracting for the camera's also focus thing. Um, so it's not like I was really sitting there or swimming there sort of thinking about the composition and planning it really. I it was really just a case of like pointing the camera in the right direction and then hoping for the best and then getting a few images out of many thousands. And similarly with the seals in fact, because with underwater stuff, it's quite hard to actually look through the, the viewfinder when you're wearing a mask. Um, uh, but because you have such a wide angle lens, uh, and the reason for that is because you want the, the, the subject to be super close uh, with a wide angle, so you can get not as much, uh, so the visibility is better. Whereas if you imagine if it was far away and you were using a telephoto lens underwater, then all the gunk that's in the water would like get in the way, whereas if it's super close and it's better. Um, but yeah, because it's such a wide angle lens and because you can't really look through the viewfinder, you're basically just sort of hoping for the best really and sort of aiming it in the general direction. Um, but then because the lens is so wide angle and because the depth of field is like so great because it's a wide angle, then that pretty much just works. So yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think that much about the composition for the seal things. It was more just a case of taking a lot of pictures and then some of them are good. As John, John has added another comment in and he says, uh, regarding luck, I would say that you were, you made your own look, luck by just being there. Yeah. That, I think that's yeah. right. Well, you spent being plenty there of time. Months, I think like, as a volunteer being there for three months, that gave me a chance to like really, uh, to, you know, get to know the locations and the animals are like, really in depth and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll move on to a few more questions. So don't forget if you're watching at home to uh, pop your question into the Q&A. Uh, we've got a few more bits of feedback as well. Brian, Brian and Lita Woodcock say, hello, Josh, many thanks for a fabulous talk. Uh, and what outstanding photos. They all need to be in the Lundy calendar. I think, I think Josh would rather sell you a copy of his own calendar. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll plug those again at the yeah. end. Um, while, while you were talking, Josh, I put your uh, your website uh, and your Insta link to your Instagram account uh, in the chat, so people watching on Zoom at home can uh, can link through to your website. And that also, yeah. you've got a shop on there, haven't you? So people can buy your. Calendar. Uh, I mean, you can't actually sort of order them online. I mean, it, it says buy calendars, and then it just says send me an email to buy a calendar. So, but, um, but there's also the a link on my website to my. Uh, films um so particularly if you if you're interested in like the underwater guillemots i did get a lot of video footage of them swimming around underwater which was really amazing and i made a little video about the lundy seabirds and so that includes those footage of underwater guillemots actually swimming around rather than just still images of that okay uh, uh Keith Minton's wife, uh, who, who doesn't who doesn't give her name, says, um, uh, "I really admire your enthusiasm. Are you hoping for a career in wildlife or, or photography?" Um, yeah. So at the moment, I actually work for the Beaver Trust, which is, or I'm sort of an intern for them technically, um, which is a charity that's all about like reintroducing beavers in the UK. Um, but then I've also been making my own videos. Um, so I would say, I, you know, I'm not really going for a career in photography, but more in like wildlife filmmaking. Um, so like I said, I made a video about Lundy seabirds and then I've made some more videos where I'm sort of presenting stuff about um, like ecology and wildlife conservation. Uh, and I made some videos about otters and Shetland. Uh, so I think the filmmaking is what I would, you know, what I would more like to go for uh, rather than the photography. Uh, but I do, I forgot to mention actually, I do also, I do give talks to um, like natural history societies and stuff. Uh, you know, I, I earn money for that. Um, people pay for the talks. So if, if anyone knows of a natural history society who might like a talk, uh, which would be similar to this talk, but it, it would have um, more stuff 
from Shetland and also deer and hares from around where I live. And I talk about beavers as well. Um, and those talks are typically up to like 45 minutes. And if you'd like to book one for a, a natural history society that you know, then send me an email as well. Great, um, great stuff. Yeah, I think we, we've, yeah. we've also got a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, uh, what triggered your interest in wildlife photography? Uh, I guess so. I was sort of inspired by watching David Attenborough documentaries, I think. Um, and then because we we lived in, we do live in the countryside, then I sort of went out and started photographing deer. Um, so yeah, I spent ages watching these roe deer near my house and I sort of got into photographing and filming them. Uh, and then after that, I was photographing hares and other species, dippers, kingfishers and stuff. Um, so yeah, I was there. I was inspired by watching David Attenborough documentaries, and then then I sort of uh, started photographing the stuff around around my house. Thank you, uh, Lorna Curtis. Hello, Lorna. Lorna uh, says fabulous talk. Thank you. Uh, did you ever have any scary moments being uh, in the water and so far off the island? Yes. Yeah, so there were some kind of dodgy bits, like on when I was on the west side of the island. I think you have to be uh, careful here because I think your mum's watching. Yeah, yeah. When I was like <laughs> getting getting in and out, because um, on the east side of the island is fine, right? Because it's quite calm there. But then on the west side, when I was getting in and the waves are sort of crashing over the rocks, um, it's all right getting in because then you just sort of slosh in, and then you go and swim around for like three hours. But then when you get out, and it's um, then it can be quite hard to climb up the rocks um so at the pyramid like uh, at jenny's cove where well which was where i was getting in and out the water was kind of like sloshing up and down as the waves come in and out so i would sort of like slosh up with the wave and then have to like grab onto a rock and then sort of crawl up but then often as i grabbed onto it the next wave would then sort of knock me off again and so, like i think one day it took like 25 attempts or something in order to get out and because i was holding the camera in one hand and then I had flippers on, so I couldn't really use my feet very well. I basically just had to sort of grab it with one hand and then try and crawl up, but then get washed off again. But it was all right. And I think the experience was, um, you know, it makes you kind of feel really alive, right? Uh, being in this kind of slightly risky scenario. Um, and, and I felt I was, it was, it was really like you're being sort of immersed in the world that the seabirds experience, right? Being sort of smashed around in the waves and stuff. Because, uh, you know, puffins and guillemots, they go miles out to sea in the winter and then they experience these massive storms. So I thought it was really incredible to, to kind of experience uh, being sort of smashed around in the waves a little bit like that. Um, and I mean, you know, like, why would you not want to do that? I mean, the sun, there was the sunset, there was the amazing seabird cliffs. It was it was totally insane. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm hoping that you can still see and hear me okay because I think my internet connection is playing up slightly but we'll press on a uh, few more comments uh, Joanne Wilby says uh, it's quite reassuring to know that I'm not alone in taking many many photos that aren't worth keeping just to get one or two that you're really pleased with uh, and Joanne's uh, not that uh, she would compare any of her efforts with any of your fabulous photos uh, Sue, Sue and Jim Maguire. Uh, hi, Josh. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and photos. Uh, you should definitely enter them for the BBC Country File and Lundy calendars, but perhaps you have already. Uh, whatever, we will visit your sites and order a calendar. Uh, okay, this evening thanks. has been inspirational. Thanks. <laughs> great, great stuff. Carol Waring. Uh, thanks, Josh. Beautiful photograph. So looking forward to visiting Lundy. Uh, my mum's also watching. She says, uh, this is Jenny Williams. Fantastic photos, Josh. Thanks. Uh, I think we're running out of questions. So uh, David can. Hello, David. Uh, he asks, uh, did the wildlife say hello while you were wild sleeping? Uh, so there were a lot of... You were under the rocks. You had a sleeping bag under the rock, didn't you? So uh, Yeah, there were a lot of... Um... There were a lot of Manx shearwaters in the night. So it was sort of quite hard to sleep, really. So I would all go up there at like 11 o'clock at night. And then the Manx shearwaters would be coming in until like three in the morning. Um, 
calling really loudly. So I would basically just sort of lying there awake listening to it. But it was pretty amazing really to lie awake listening to Meng Shi Waters. Um, yeah. And Any then terrestrial, terrestrial wildlife come up, is oh, it you? Uh, no, not really, no, because I mean, I was sort of like, um, again, it's Coombe, there's a little uh, kind of outcrop that sticks out in the middle of the bay, and I was sleeping on there, so um, I don't think like deer would sort of go onto that, because right? it's like right next to the coast, I never really, I never saw a deer or anything in the night, um, yeah, I, I was sort of like lie there awake in the night listening to main shields, and then I would like go and sleep at 11 o'clock in the morning or something in my room. <laughs> Okay, uh, last couple of questions then. Uh, Paul Holt asks, uh, how close were you to the puffins? Presumably these are, these are the photos when you were in the water. How, how close were you? Um, I would say the closest was maybe like three metres. So, they, yeah, they weren't super close. They did sort of um, swim towards you on the water surface. But then when they got within about five or ten meters then they would typically sort of dive down and then you see them under the water but yeah that was actually a problem that they were often just too far away underwater uh so they were too small in the frame in order to get any decent image um so that's why it took so many attempts in order to get just a few images that were any good uh, whereas the seals i mean the seals are like zero meters away from you they would come up and investigate the lens pretty much um, so yeah, the puffins were maybe like five or ten meters away, often or up as close as three meters, but like not not really closer than that. Okay, and our last question. Uh, I think this is a bit tongue in cheek, but Keith Minton asks: uh, Is there a photo of you with the cuddly puffin on your head? Oh no, I didn't take one actually. And I always <laughs> think, I always think like um, when I give talks, I always say, oh, it would be good if I had a photo of me with the cuddly puffin. Um, Maybe next time. Well, I mean, because I thought when I was there, I was like, well, should I take a picture of a puffin because it would be cool to show people or will I then miss a picture of a puffin for real if I do that? So I was thinking, actually, no, I'm not going to take a selfie because then I'll just miss the, the real puffin. Um, but it would have been, yeah, it would have been quite useful for talks, wouldn't it, to have a picture of a puffin. Next time, when you can, you can remember for the next talk. Okay, well, um, Thank you everybody for, for your questions. Uh, I need to uh, move us on to, our, to my usual plug. So uh, I'm going to um, plug uh, the Lundy Field Society. So I've got the wrong slide up, there we go. Uh, so uh, please, if you've, uh, if you've not yet joined the Lundy Field Society, then do. Uh, th these talks are being uh, presented with support from the LFS. Um, the details are on the screen uh, and the membership uh, is open to all and your subscriptions directly support uh, the conservation work that we do on Lundy. We also have a couple more events uh, coming up uh, before Christmas. So our next talk uh, is on Tuesday the 17th of December. Uh, sorry, Tuesday the 1st of December, I beg your pardon. Uh, and Sue Sayer and... Uh, and Kate, uh, I can't actually read what this says, Kate Williams, there we go, uh, are going to be here uh, to talk about the Lundy, the Lundy Seals uh, on that evening. So really, really looking forward to that one. Uh, those of you who visited Lundy last summer will remember uh, there was uh, Septimus the seal, the, the skeleton of the seal uh, was in the church. So really looking forward to hearing from Sue and Kate. Uh, just before Christmas, we've got our Morisco Tavern Quiz. So it's going to be a very, very different webinar that evening. Uh, and then John Tyra, who we've heard from this evening with some of his questions, is following up from the photography workshop that he did in the spring with, uh, with a, second, a second webinar. So uh, please do join, please, please do put the dates in your diary and then, and then join us for those. Okay, uh, so uh, what else do I need to remind you of? Um, details about how to join each of the talks are going to be posted on Facebook as usual and members of the Lundy Field Society uh, will get the usual email. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, you'll be asked to complete a feedback survey. Um, as ever, thank you everybody who's filled these in in the past. Uh, your, your feedback is really, really useful. So um, please do spend a minute or two filling it in. 
My thanks also to Dave Richards uh, for hosting us this evening. These events really could not take place without Dave's support. Thank, thank you, Josh, for a really inspirational, uh, beautifully illustrated talk this evening. Um, would you like to say your goodbyes to our audience? Okay, yeah, goodbye. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you everybody at home for watching. I hope you can join us next time. Bye-bye.